Starting with episode 10, a uh, recap from the 52 weeks. That episode was called What You May Not Have Known About Live Rock. Very open-ended. Man, do I know more about Live Rock than I did today. <laughs> and still, I don't know enough about Live Rock today. Yeah. Uh, the conversation has evolved so much. Uh, so this is our core belief, though. This is if, uh, if you want to, uh, if you share this one, listen up. If you don't, share it, check out, or maybe come along for the ride and maybe we'll change your belief. Yeah. Uh, but core belief in relation to live rock. Rock choice will define your journey. Get the right tool for the right job. Mm. There isn't a best option for all applications here. If, if. Uh, if you think there is, I want to hear what you think is the best, like, for everything, for a new person, an advanced reefer, uh, every possible thing, you know, I aggressive reef. Challenge uh, that it doesn't exist. I don't think it exists either. No, so no. Uh, the rock choice here, I think, will define your journey, get the right tool for the right job. And we're going to share some of those things, starting uh, with what we believe matters most in relation to Live Rock. Live Rock. All right. First thing that we believe matters most is it, it's new. It's kind of a new concept and that biome is the future. So like what is the makeup of, you know, you know how many times, especially like, uh, you know, being a stickhead in this entire journey for me in the hobby and just, uh, you know, it seems like there's a little extra challenge in the, in, in keeping them for me. Um, but what I've always heard was, uh, you know, uh, of when somebody would have a, a, a whole bunch of frags or sticks or something like that, uh, fail and but they were in the early phases of their tank like six months or a year there was uh, so much advice I got from uh, sticks was uh, this unknown maturity of the tank it was like your tank wasn't mature enough and there was this conversation about maturity which you know what is that supposed to mean? Like, I, I don't know what mature means. Does that mean I got to wait a year before I can put sticks in? Does that mean uh, I'm screwed from the get? Or, you know, can I, is there a way to mature faster in my tank than, than what before? Uh, and I actually think now that the definition of that maturity is this biome. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. I believe five years from now, when everybody's talking about this, nobody will be talking about cycling your tank. They'll be talking about biome. Your biome. Tanks. Yeah. S establishing biome. Like mm. cycling the tank is a conversation of ammonia that uh, we'll get to later. Yeah. Uh, but like a biome, man, is the things that prevent, you know, all the little competitive organisms in the tank that really prevent any one of them from getting out of control. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, balance <clears throat> each other. And so the, the reason I think that we were able to evolve the conversation, it's kind of like ICP in the old days. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, like all of a sudden I have vision into an area of the tank I didn't have. You know, that, I, what you do with that is a different question. Right. But like now with the PCR testing and DNA testing, I can get not only does the tank not mature, but the data suggests it as well. Yeah. Right. right. And so mm -hmm. like there's a. It's not necessarily I'm going to go do the PCR testing and say, oh, well, now I know what I need to solve. But like when we can test, especially in things like investigates here, when I can test it and say, oh, well, now I understand why what I'm seeing sucks. Mm. Right. Also, it, it can, you know, get to the bottom of the question of like, does my tank have ick or velvet or whatever in it? Right. Yeah, well, yes. Does it's present <laughs> DNA in there is present. Uh, we don't have to have that conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you're going to see, you know, and I, I'm really curious actually, because if you're following the little updates I'm doing on Facebook, I'm trying to do one about every week so you can see the progression of those twelve tanks. Yeah, is some of them are doing way better than others, and you'd be surprised which ones they are. Like yeah. One of them I was really surprised by is it looks like the one that we just took the it was dry rock, dry sand. We just took the water, 100% of the water out of the 160 seems to be doing really well. It is. Yeah, it's so yeah. interesting. And I wouldn't have thought because you always hear like there's not a lot of stuff in the water. Yeah. Well, on the opposite end of that, uh, some of the tanks that are being tested back there that, you know, you would think like like the, the bacteria or whatever it doesn't live in the water column. You hear that forever. And like there's no, you know, this... Uh, uh, cycled water and uh, you know what does that even mean is that it can be true but then you go and look at the tank next to it or two tanks down from that one and you see the actual sand and the rubble that came out like where the bacteria are housed that came out of uh, 
uh, like your 360 tank or some other tanks, and it doesn't look good. No, you it's can like, see. You can see where it's come from. Yeah. And it, the, it's going to ebb and flow. We'll see. But like even some of the tanks that look really good right now. So right now, if you watch these things in terms of biome, uh, don't mm. be surprised at the live rock. So we got the Indonesian rock from Route 66. Yep. We got the Gulf rock. We have uh, uh, the actually, you know, it's funny in the last update, the real reef looked really good. In two days, man, it turned totally around. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but those two live rocks look really good. And uh, the bio brick from one of them looks really good, or did look good for a while. But here's the problem, man. Also, the golf rock, also the yellowest from all the stuff that's decaying, has the most algae growth on the glass from all the nutrients, mm. has uh, gorilla cra crabs in it that kill the fish. Uh, the fish don't even go in the rock anymore because they're afraid of the crab. Uh, <laughs> it has uh, uh, pest uh, anemones on it. Uh, the uh, brick from the 700 has pest and enemies, bubble algae. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I think the first one's going to end up with bryopsis in it. Oh, like, the so, coral only has bryopsis in it? Yeah. I, I th it looks to me like the, the mm. one from the, uh, what do you call it, the, the Indonesian rock. So, like, biome is not just just like some bacteria. It's so many things. You're going to see that in these PCR reports. So, yep. check it out. Okay, so the next thing that we believe uh, matters most is uh, we're going to give some distinct advice here. Like, uh, you can debate this stuff. I'm looking for the 80-20s, the highest percentage paths, uh, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. But live rock is the highest percentage path uh, for 12-month path and best path for new reefers. So I, if, uh, if you want to... Uh, I could see this. I, if you, you, I think you said in your office when we were talking about this. I, if your grandma were to come up to you and ask you, you know, what should I use? And I've never had a reef tank before, and what's gonna, my, what am I gonna have the least hard time with? It would be live rock. Established live rock. Just it's ready to go. Yeah, and, and and that's showing right now to be the case as well. Yeah, you're gonna get up eptasia mm -hmm. or pested enemies. Yeah, you're gonna get bubble algae. Yeah, you're gonna get all these other things. But I'm also gonna have a beautiful tank for the first 12 months. Right. You know, I'm gonna like, get my feet wet. I'm gonna be success. I'm not running into dinos. I'm not running all this garbage. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm gonna repeat it again. Live rock, meaning rock that you got out of the ocean from Indonesia, from Bali, from wherever. Uh, the problem is, is all those places have shut down the amount of rock that's coming out of them mm. to a trickle. And they're now like, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 bucks a pound, which if I own 100 pounds of rock, then I'm in this for two grand. Wow. You know? So it's just some rock. <laughs> but is it easier? Yeah. yeah. So the second question is, is can I get live rock from an established tank? So far, it looks like, yeah, but you also know, get all the things that might have been in that tank, like LG and other mm -hmm. things too. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that would be best probably done. Like when you see it at WWC, that was big vats of live rock yeah. uh, and they're sitting at the end of the systems, not necessarily in light. It's, and so like you're getting all that biome, but you're not like all the photosynthetic garbage isn't uh, in there. And yeah. It's really cycling for a really long period of time. So. Yeah, but if you're asking me from uh, the first 12 months, I just want to be successful. I just want to have a, a really nice tank. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to crash it or come up with so many challenges that I end up pulling my hair out and, you know, this hobby was not for me. Screw After this. eating flatworms and little red bugs are not a concern for your first 12 months for most people. Yeah. Like, they probably aren't even doing SPS corals in that case. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and Aptasia can be beat or at least fought back. Actual live rock, probably the best. Mm. What about the next one? Uh, next one is uh, purple rock is a higher percentage path for new reefers also. So that uh, instant, it's almost like instant tank look because you when we did the five, when you did the five minute guide, when we pulled, you know, real reef rock, took it out, put it in the tank, filled it up, put corals in it. That all happened in like a day or uh, two days. And uh, guess what? Turned out all right. You know, and it I, wasn't bone white, nasty, uh, covered in brown over the like we turned the lights on. And even after a week, after two weeks, those tanks still look good. I was in the lab, like ex inspecting the rocks yesterday. Mm. Uh, and 
I was looking at the real reef one. It's you know purple rock that's been soaking for months in some vat somewhere. Yeah, I'd love to go there and see how this works. <laughs> but uh, it's an artificial rock, and uh, we saw little specks of brown in the sand, and that has since like immediately taken over the whole sand. Yeah, but. Here's the, the funny part is, if you look really close, that brown crud is actually on the rock as well. You just can't see it. <laughs> because the purple hides it. And so there's like this brown film that grows over something white, like a reef saber, and I can see it really easy. Even just like a, a really thin brown film, I can see, but a thin brown film on purple rock, I can't see. And here's the thing is like in a matter of uh, weeks to months, it's all going to go away anyway. Mm -hmm. So if as a new reefer, it's there, but I don't know it because I don't know what to look for. And it just like comes and goes. and I never even saw it. Boom. That's yeah. a win. You know, I, I actually had an a interesting conversation with uh, Elliot at Marine Collectors the other day. You were there actually for that conversation. Oh, with the fish. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, so should you just watch the fish when you put it in? He's like, well, part of me wants to tell you to not even look at the tank for two days. Like, put the thing in and then come back in two days and see what happened. Yeah, because reefers are like so finicky. If it doesn't eat in the first three seconds, they're like, they want to capture it, and, like put a funnel in its mouth and feed it. And <laughs> if it's like looking a little funny, it's capture it. And like, you just keep doing these things that cause more and more and more stress. And yeah. like, you know, like if I have you know, a little bit of brown in there. It's like, oh, maybe I need some chemi clean. Up. Maybe I need yeah. some carbon. Maybe I need some you know, lanthium chloride. Maybe I need some yeah, like yeah. a mad scientist. If, if, if for a new, brand new reefer, if the purple rock just hides the brown film, they don't even know it, and they just cycle back through it, like ignorance is bliss in this case. <laughs> you know, true. so I agree with like I this. Did that. I mean, in the. Uh, the BRS, you know, on that Ask BRS community uh, Facebook group, and even though as a new reefer and stuff like that, I've uh, answered some of those. So many times you see the question pop up uh, with, oh, it's my first tank, it's brand new, I use dry rock, it's white, uh, and then all of a sudden there's this, what's this weird brown spot? What's this brown spot? What's that green spot? What is this big spot? And uh, you know, like you said, a lot of times it's just it's like diatoms or something. You just really you know don't need to con overly concern yourself about and like tear down the tank and brush every nook and cranny and uh, water change until the brown is gone. And a hundred percent, like purple rock, you don't even see it. It's not even a problem. Mm -hmm. mm. It's true. All right. So next one though, pest free dry, sterile-ish rock mm. uh, or aquaculture dry rock is the best for your forever tank. Higher or, path of success. I'm going to say forever tank or for an, an experienced reefer who wants to have five, six, seven years. And again, like you can have any, everybody has had success with, I mean, you could put potatoes in the tank and somebody had success with it. But <laughs> like, I'm talking high percentage pass. Like I'm into this for five years. I'm looking back and say, yeah, I did the right thing. Yeah. Not that the first 12 months are a little harder than others. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so in this case, like I don't want to, ha I want to have as few pests in this as possible. I don't want to introduce uh, ick from the uh, bat of water from uh, the fish store that, you know, brought in the live rock. Mm. For that reason I'd probably would, get live rock in a box rather than in uh, uh, bats of water. Because, I mean, to be frank, man, in that environment, probably that water has every disease known to man because they can't put copper in the live rock. And if there's ever been fish in there, it's going to have that in there somewhere. Yeah. So I uh, I think that inherently when when you think of, uh, we, we say it's best for your forever tank, uh, to me that means, in the back of my mind, that means uh, if I'm planning a forever tank, I've already been, this isn't my first rodeo. You know, yeah. I'm not planning my forever tank as a brand new reefer, first getting into the hobby. And there's probably, I mean, there's a, uh, there's some people out there that, there are some, that, yeah. that falls into, but uh, like, uh, if I, if you were going to uh, categorize a major, uh, the majority, uh, you're planning your forever tank is uh, not your first rodeo. So those, all those little brown spots and everything that you fight with that, that sterile bone white rock. Uh, you already know how to battle, and you know what the other side of it looks like. You just don't even care. Yeah. It'll just go away yeah. on its own. It'll eventually work itself out. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah. So, But I don't want acre and flatworms. I don't want, uh, uh, you know, parasitic copepods. I don't want, uh, 
you know, all the Vibrio is I don't want, mm. uh, uh, like we had some kind of black little speck. I don't know what it even was that like wiped out a, oh, yeah. a whole SPS tank here. And a whole I don't bunch even know what it was. Yeah. 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 And so I don't want all of these things. I don't want Aptasia. I don't want bubble algae. Those things can be beat to some degree, but I, I like just don't want to be constantly fighting this stuff. And some of this stuff will be introduced mm -hmm. no matter what, but in really small quantities and I can fight it and I'll probably only have to deal with half of them rather than all of them. Yeah. Uh, and especially, you know, if you're really setting up like a dream style forever tank, like my re recent experience is, is here. I mean, we're able to fight them back, but there's acro eating flatworms in this tank. Yes. And still. You know, we use a series of KZ products, the flatworm stop, the coral booster. We blow off uh, the adults and Got we put in, in some yeah. uh, wrasses in there that tend to eat them, that file fish eats them. Loves them. Yeah, and so we did some things to like maintain uh, or uh, uh, to manage, manage the, the mm. fact that they're in there. But I'd like to just not have them the, in there to begin wish with. that wasn't a thing that we have to manage from now on. Yeah. So most of the time, if you get aquacultured frags from uh, SPS frags from a, you know, a reputable place, you probably won't get aquarine frack worms in your tank. Cause mm -hmm. if they had them, they wouldn't be able to farm them. And in yeah. most cases yeah. anyway. Mm. Uh, and so also though, like, I think, you know, if I set up another, if I set up another LPS, because you can't really aquaculture LPS as easy, you know, yeah. like if I wanted to like a torch, dream torch tank, kind of like the one I set up in my house. Mm -hmm. Well, I had problems with like brown jelly disease and like now there's hundreds of these corals and it's really hard to like solve it all afterwards. Yeah. So I think if I was going to do a wild caught tank, uh, I would put like I, with with euphilia, I would treat really aggressively for brown jelly degree disease. And I probably would set up a small little frag tank, kind of like, what was that, advanced acrylics or something? Yeah, yeah, the one that we yeah. put with the I don't need a fancy system, just a small little system where I can put those frags I got, let them sit in there for, you know, a month or two, make sure that uh, they look healthy, they're staying healthy, they're not affecting anything else, and then move them into the tank. But I don't want to take that stuff from live rock and, you know, put brown jelly disease into the tank and then like have to go break out every last one of the affiliate out there as it's kind of chewing through one through them one at yeah, a time. Yeah, and mm. I want to do better. So if you're setting up a forever tank, sterile ish, uh, uh, pest free dry rock is probably the best. So that's kind of gets to that core belief. Right rock choice will define your journey. You know, pests versus ease of use versus yeah. does it look good right day one? Does it look good in the end? Also, even things like defining your journey in terms of the HNSA. Uh, like I built this really elaborate aquascape. I, you know, I was going to say you can't do that with Fiji, but we watched Brent actually do it. I wish he had a photo. Oh, of yeah, it. he did. Uh, he, you know like, what? I'll, I'll ask Brent and I'll put it up on my Facebook or, and we'll, we'll throw it up on uh, uh, the, the community tab of YouTube as well. Uh, but... Yeah, you. there's certain types of rock that I can actually break apart and rebuild into something and that I really want to build that speaks to my heart. And I don't care that it's going to look a little brown in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I care about where I'm going, not necessarily the first step of the journey. Hmm. Next one. Uh, another thing that we believe matters most when it comes to live rock is uh, don't turn the lights on to 350 par day one. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's kind of something, uh, it wasn't day one that we did it on the 750, uh, but there was a, from that thing from, uh, Josh just says, you know what, turn the lights on and embrace the brown town, embrace the suck. So I would say if you're using live rock, it's a little closer or really, really established rock. Mm. It's less important that you edge your, hedge your bets, yeah. right? Uh, they turn it on 350, you know, and if it goes south, then just turn them off and start yeah, over. And you right? can turn them on to 100. Yeah, you can just doesn't like, have to be max 350. Yeah, if you're at 350 and it's just not going the way you want, you can turn it back down to 100. You can just actually just turn the lights down to zero, let the photosynthetic garbage uh, dissipate over the week and start again. And gradual burn them, turn yeah. back up. Uh, but like for me, I think if I had to give advice to somebody that was counting on me, I would say. Start by turning the lights on to something in the LPS range, you know, between 50, 150, probably lower. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, let it go that way. Just enjoy the fish that are in there for a month, you know, and add some fish that are interesting to you. So, you know, you can, you know, connect with your pets and just make sure it doesn't like get out of hand before you raise the lights up. Mm. So uh, start at 50, kind of raise it up to, you know, 100, 150. And if you're seeing success, then let it go. So that's actually what I'm doing in my office right now is uh, for the first couple of weeks when I moved the tank over here, I got the fish in, I got new sand, I got the rock uh, for the 360. And so what I'm doing is I turned the Kessels on originally just because I want to enjoy the fish. Now, a week ago, I turned uh, the skies on mm -hmm. uh, to about 10 percent. And I'm going to keep raising it up until I get uh, every week or so until I get into the SPS zone. Once I'm in that zone and I don't have any problems, and right now it's looking spectacular. Mm -hmm. So once I get in that zone, I don't have any problems. Well, test SPS frags, and then when those do well, uh, it's time to just fill the tank. You know? Would be an interesting next experiment on the uh, in the twelve test tanks in the back. Is uh, this tank starts with light a hundred percent day one? This thing starts with light at 50% uh, day one, and each of them are on like this gradual increase scale and just kind of see what happens. So the, the nature of it is, is without the light, all of the biome is in the tank is essentially consuming some kind of nutrient, whether it's pulling it out of the water, or it's fine decaying material, whatever it is, it's getting its energy from finding it and consuming it, yeah. right? Whereas once you turn the lights on, there's all of this energy that comes from uh, the uh, lights, the photosynthetic energy. There's mm -hmm. like this kind of infinite amount of, not infinite, but like really it's high degree of fuel. air, yeah. of fuel. And then if I go from 50 to 350, man, there's seven times as much as fuel. fuel on. <laughs> uh, and it might fuel some things really, really rapidly. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think about that. If somebody is asking me for advice, don't turn the lights on to 350 par the first day and expect high percentage success unless you got unbelievably established rock. Yeah. All right. Next one. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, ammonia is more about live rock than dry. Okay, so this is one of those experiments that we like never got around to shooting the video for. We probably oh, should. Yeah, we were watching. Uh, we tested uh, uh, like uh, the cycling some uh, tanks with clownfish. Right. Fishless cycle or clown or fish cycle or you know uh, bacterial with ammonia uh, like you, yeah, we you tried dose ammonia. There's a bunch of stuff. So here's the thing is we never saw an ammonia spike <clears> in <throat> these dry rock tanks. These are E-170s. We threw two clownfish in and started feeding it. And we never really saw any ammonia in any of them, hmm. right? And like to the point where we're like, what is going on? We're testing, you know, with uh, the hawk. We're testing with the hobby kit. And we're just not seeing any ammonia in these dry, sterile tanks, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we're like, all right, well, let's kick it in the butt and add eight clownfish. <laughs> and we still didn't see any ammonia from these things. Now, recently though, uh, we put live rock in some tanks uh, as part of our cycle biome test and ammonia skyrockets on the uh, hmm. two live rock ones because they have decaying organic material on them. Hmm. And I couldn't help but wonder from that moment, is all of this conversation about ammonia not about the fish and the food that we add to the tank? Because maybe that's manageable as long as you're not dumping tons and tons of food or tons of fish day one. But if like people who cycle a tank with two clownfish they have really high success rates. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe it's just because it's so little amount of ammonia that the tank actually builds it up in real time almost like, mm. cause it never gets to the measurable amount in a test kit. But if I used live rock, like this is the stuff that we all grew up on, uh, mm. Fiji rock that sat in a box. It was in a boat for a month and then stored somewhere, shipped somewhere. Like it was been out of the ocean for two months, man, wrapped yeah. in no newspaper. Stuff's done. I put that in there. All kinds of stuff is dying and turning into ammonia, but dry still rock. In, think about think about a hundred pounds of rock that I put into the tank that has been sitting in a Fiji box for two months, versus a couple of clownfish and a couple pellets of fish food I feed them every day. Mm. Totally not relevant to each other at all. So I think we're gonna go dig back into that uh, experiment. Maybe we'll even repeat it. But like, 
I it would not be surprised to find out if this statement was true. And what I currently believe is ammonia and cycling your tank, as long as you do it with a reasonable amount of fish, is actually more about live rock and all the decaying organics on the rock than it is about the two little fish you dropped in. Interesting. I don't know. Uh, next one, we believe it matters most. We should stop referring to the nitrogen cycle uh, when we talk about cycling dry rock. Why is that? Well, I, when you talk about cycling, like it, if you're talking about the nitrogen cycle and you refer to it as a nitrogen cycle, so mm -hmm. be it. Like that's really, I guess it's, you know, you're, you're making sure that toxic ammonia is in the tank. But like, as we just discussed, it's like so easy, almost like you can do almost nothing and it will happen. Right. Yeah. And like, and, and nothing also is a, nothing. They just put the live rock in in a month from now, it will be done too. Like, it's not really a lot you're going to do or not do about that. It's just kind of telling you when to add your fish. Mm -hmm. Right. But as we talk about today's cycle, what we're really talking about is we're getting all of the biome, all the different types of bacteria and everything in there ready to put life in the tank. Uh, Not just that there's so toxic ammonia won't support life for so fish. many yeah. other things. Yeah. Support like the maturity for SPS, right? Like what is that magic number? Or yeah. whatever it is. <laughs> uh, and I, I just think that it's not helpful at this point. We've evolved past it. And hopefully five years from now, when we say the word cycle, everyone that's listening knows that it really isn't referring to the nitrogen cycle anymore. It's a much bigger picture. Mm, I could see that happening. All right, uh, I will say the next one here okay. is uh, UV will prevent some opportunistic pets from winning the photosynthetic battle. Yeah, well, this one we found out uh, uh, on the 750. Yeah, every time we've plugged in UV now on different tanks, 750 was one of the biggest ones where bare bottom tank, brand new, lights are on, we're embracing the brown and bacteria bloom. All right, let's put a UV sterilizer off to the side, bacteria bloom gone. Uh, all right, 750 now has dinos. Uh, let's put the UV sterilizer back on and black it out. Gone, mm -hmm. uh, done. And so uh, you think about when you're starting the tank, um, and some of these opportunistic pests like dinos and maybe it's in cyano and things like that, uh, bacterial blooms, uh, UV sterilizers more than just, to, you know, at this point, it's not just a tool for uh, managing the ick uh, in your fish or managing disease in your fish. It can actually help with the tank as a whole. Yeah, we thought about this uh, originally. Uh, like when I started the hobby, it was all related to like fish parasite and stuff. Now this is a super common tool to either avoid altogether or treat uh, ongoing issues like bacterial blooms or dinos or all those other things that many of them are photosynthetic, right? And so like dinos that you'll know whether or not, for the most part, whether or not UV will help solve this problem for you because at night they actually dissipate and go away uh, into the water column, right? And then they mm -hmm. fill, and the lights come back on and they form these clusters again. Well, if they do that and they go back in the water column at night, they're photosynthetic organism that's in the water, we can sterilize all and they'll stop replicating tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and so the problem like goes away almost instantly mm -hmm. from something that is very difficult to disrupt in any other of a manner. And so, uh, just a solution to a really difficult problem that many people have. So UV, especially uh, if you're using dry rock, in many cases will prevent some opportunistic pets from winning. And you know, those, uh, we, what we did actually on the 750 was add in the hang, not a hang on the back. We kind of made a hang on the back essentially. Yeah, just piped a, a pump down over the side through a UV sterilizer and back over the edge. Yeah, so like we didn't install the UV permanently. We just tried to solve the, today's problem, right? So threw the mm -hmm. pump over the edge, just dangling in the tank and then have it go back in and solve the problem, take it off and you're done if you ever need it and have the problem again. And that one kind of ebbed and flowed and finally we just installed it permanently. <laughs> but for, uh, <laughs> and then problems calling it permanently as well. Yeah. Uh, but like we were talking about it actually in the, uh, uh, yesterday about the, They'll hang on the back ones now. Oh, the UV, right? yeah, aqua UV. Generally speaking, I wouldn't use those for protecting my fish unless it was a really small system because it probably isn't going to have the right contact time. Mm -hmm. But uh, to solve something like a bacterial bloom or a, a, a dino issue, perfect, man. Hang it on the back, get it going, mm. solve your problem, turn it off. 
and yeah. put it away. Mm. You know, it's just a tool to be able to solve it and really easy to do. If you're having those kind of problems today, I could order one of these things. I could solve my problem by next weekend and be done. <laughs> you know, like, why am I keep fighting these problems? Yeah. You know, so uh, there you go. Kind of hit this next one already. Uh, but if you have problems, turn the lights off. It's a reset button. Uh, especially uh, all of the stuff that starts to grow after you turn your lights on, meaning that they're all photosynthetic uh, pests and problems. Stop fueling them. Turn yeah. it off. This doesn't really apply probably to a lot of the people that use live rock and you're on a different journey. But if you're using today's dry rock, which is what most people, 90% of people will use, yeah. if you're running into a problem, then uh, you know what? Just turn the lights off or way down and you will probably alleviate that problem. If you don't have corals in there, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> you, you actually then even turn the lights on only to the period that you're actually home. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, and like that might even be a generally good idea anyway to prevent like algae and stuff growing around the glass. Oh, like, yeah. You know, the fish don't necessarily need that light in many cases. So like, or it could ebb and flow. It, it could be on during the day, but at 10%, you know, yeah. and a little different for your, your viewing pleasure later. So if you're having those problems, don't be afraid to just turn the damn lights off, man. <laughs> and, and like, that's why you don't put corals in in many cases immediately mm. is because it gives you that tool and the ability to just hit a reset button without worrying about yeah. a lot. Yeah. This next one was uh, WWC from the, you know, we talked about mentors yesterday and Josh being one of the mentors there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one of the th lessons that we learned from WWC was utilitarian fish and using them as like your the the fish are a better cleanup crew than uh, when somebody says cleanup crew, crew to you what do you think uh and for me it's snails crabs uh, red legs blue legs trochus all these different types of snails and crabs and whatnot uh urchins maybe uh but actually your bigger cleanup crew the more effective cleanup crew is the the fish that you choose to put in there specifically tanks mm -hmm. uh so you know josh uh, says you uh, the thing we believe the most here is tangs are, tangs are the solution to fighting algae on new rock. We've seen it time and time again. We were doing uh, UV sterilizer experiments where there was a tang in there and the tangs were eating, eating up a majority of the algae on some of those experiments. But uh, any other tank that we've started uh, around here, throw in a tang. And there you go. The fish are able to swim around and grab it everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. they'll grab it in the glass, they'll grab it everywhere. So and it's uh, their job. That's, I mean, that's what their intended natural behavior is to constantly pick at rocks to and eat algae. Well, there you go. Why wouldn't you put that in your tank as a tool? Yeah. Like, so your yellow tangs, your purple tangs, your uh, bristle tooth tanks, uh, the white tail tanks, all those things are going to change the trajectory of your tank, especially in the beginning. Uh, so if your tank, your rock has algae on it, so be it. Mm. Uh, okay, I, I said this one earlier too. I prefer boxed rock out of water versus uh, over what rock that's in a holding bin at a store. Mm. Uh, you know, and that one's probably controversial a little bit, but like if I were going to get live rock, I don't want it in a system that's been exposed to, I want it to be exposed to as few pests as possible. So, you know, like judge that for yourself or like stores are all different. When you go to that store and it looks like it's probably been exposed to everything known to man, it probably has. Mm. If they have shown you the lengths that they've gone to make sure it isn't exposed, then hey, that's probably one of the best places to buy it. Uh, but I don't want to buy live rock that I know that like, literally has been exposed to every last disease known to man mm. in that system and it hasn't been ever shut down in 10 years you know <laughs> so uh you know consider that as you know your different destinations uh believe matters most about live rock here uh, another one is purple looks best day one and hides mistakes like the second time we said it and it actually it's true like we've found this in the five minute guide so the Real reef rock is probably the best example of that. Uh, this yeah. one actually here too. That was this like Walt, Walt Smith, Smith 2.0. Yeah, I don't think they we sell that anymore. But uh, the real reef one, it does cost more. It's man-made. It's uh, you know like turned purple, so mm. it is more work than just collecting some rock off the ground. <laughs> uh, you know, it's mining some rock out of Florida. It is more work to produce and it has a cost to it, but that cost can actually result in a much more pleasurable first year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, decide for yourself which one of those things is most important. 
And one of the things I think we're going to find here too is when this is actually ties into something we said earlier, like the tank that has just the water out of the 360 in it, dry sand, dry rock, and the experiment tank that we have mm -hmm. uh, is doing really well. Like makes me believe in biome in a bottle more than ever. So yeah. like, I don't know. We're gonna, the next evolution of these experiments is we'll go back and like look at all the commercially available biome in a bottle, different bacteria you can mm. dose and stuff. We'll, we'll test them both visually, but also with to, the PCR yeah, testing. Yeah, send it to the PCR. That's a, the, I can't wait for the PCR test results for all of these different tanks just to like put them all up on the wall and go, huh, and draw a whole bunch of conclusions. So the reason that we're doing all these experiments is because this is a piece that I feel like we haven't as a hobby identified yet, which is how do I get the best of both worlds? Mm -hmm. How do I get the dry, sterile rock that I can work with and aquascape really well without, you know, like I can't aquascape wet rock it'll just dry out and then the whole purpose is gone <laughs> yeah, exactly right? yeah or like i can't do really elaborate aquascapes. yeah you can't do an hnsa with it yeah, yeah so uh how do i do that how do i avoid the pest but how do i not also run into all those problems well it's i i guarantee out of these 12 different methods a mm. couple of them are going to pop out as the best and then when we go to the like biome in a bottle stuff and then we can kind of combine the different mm. methods into one. I'm pretty certain that we're going to find the, if you did it this way, 95% of people would have a flawless first year. We would end up coming back to this episode and changing what we believe matters most and getting rid of the live rocks, the highest percentage path for new reefers, 12 month plan. Purple rocks, the higher percentage path of new reefers. Pest free dry rock is the uh, best for, is the best plan for your forever tank. Uh, if we get, if we can come in through and say, you know, expand the conversation about biome and how important it is, and then find the solution to biome where it doesn't matter what rock I choose, as specifically the the pest free dry rock. Uh, if I add this biome in a bottle or I diversify my biome from day one, no problems. Okay. Or very very little problems. So some hard lessons in relation to what you might not have known about live rock. Uh, starting with the first one. I personally didn't believe in copepods. It's just something uh, that just showed up on its own and not going to do anything about it. You know, and we're all jaded by our experiences, mm. right? So like my first experience was this golf rock and there was like, I could put a flashlight out and balls of copepods would follow it around at night. Yeah. And there's so many. <laughs> and, and so like, like, and I know that you can't really even prevent the copepods from coming in. In fact, I saw a salt test many years ago that Eric Borman did. They autoclaved the tanks and mm. somehow copepods still made it in just from the salt mix. And like they found <laughs> copepods in these tanks. Like, and then I sat through a seminar at one of the IMAX and mm. uh, one of the people that sells copepods for a living, uh, they, somebody stood up in the crowd and was like, asked the question, is like, you know, don't you feel like a little shame for selling copepods because these things will just populate in your tank on their own? And she literally stood there and said, I sell these things because people will buy them. <laughs> and I was appalled. And I'm like, you should be so ashamed of yeah. what, and I can't believe at least you owned it, I guess. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but you say you, but the you said you didn't believe in them. Does that mean you've changed your ways? I have changed my belief structure mm. now. Is that like I think that it's true that the copepods will replicate on their own, especially in a world where ninety percent of us back then were using live rock. They're coming on the live rock, and they were going to populate no mm -hmm. matter what. Mm -hmm. They're still going to come on your uh, frag corals. Uh, corals and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, the frags, uh, they're going to find their way into the tank. I don't think you could prevent copepods from entering your tank, even if you wanted to. Yeah. So that was the way I thought about it before, but now I'm thinking about desirable. it is desirable in the beginning. Mm. Like, so the question is still, when do you add them? But like in the beginning, because I feel like copepods now are actually part of the cleanup crew. Mm -hmm. Tiny little microscopic, microscopic uh, guys are running around eating organics off of the rock all day long. Something the same way that the, Tangs do. Yeah, your tangs can't, uh, so they can get to 
places and uh, size of materials that uh, nothing else in your tank can. Mm -hmm. uh, even a snail, you think about a snail and uh, it's limited in its mobility because it gets stuck in crevices and they can't get deep inside. But these little copepods, that's where exactly where they live. The copepods are going to, like their population to be based on two things. The amount of food that's available, mm -hmm. meaning the amount of organics that are growing on your rock surface, uh, as well as predators. And if you don't have a mandarin or like certain types of wrasses, mm, a lot of times, there's, and, yeah. I mean, a copepod, like people often think of it as like an amphipod, which is like a little teeny shrimp that you can look at. Uh, the best way you can see a copepod is go look at your glass and look at all the little white specks. And once in a while, one of them will they jump. Move. Yep. It'll just jump a little <laughs> bit. And it's like a little microscopic jack, uh, yep. uh, a ball that you can barely see. These things are actually living all over the surface of your uh, rock work, eating the organics off. And so, like, now I think that you should can find a way to interject these things as part of the biome up front. Yeah. Right? Mm. And so the question is when. And I don't think it's actually the first day you set up the tank because there's actually no food for them then. Mm. Like there's nothing growing on this rock surface. So the ones you add will probably all just die. So when brown town starts coming? Well, I, what I'm thinking is like you run the tank, you know, for some period of time, you got your fish in there, you've been feeding the corals. There's probably some little slime coat or something that's starting to grow on the rock. Mm. Uh, and then the answer is, should I put the copepods in before I turn the lights on? or like really quickly right after when definitely when the photosynthetic light, uh, energy comes in, all of a sudden there'll be stuff on the rock for sure. Mm. And it's a chicken the egg that I'm not 100% sure on yet, but if uh, like my grandma asked me, man, should I add copepods? I'm gonna get past uh, like all the stuff that I felt before with dry rock specifically, I think getting a, like a booster population mm -hmm. of this stuff, especially if I'm not going to add corals immediately, will help increase the, the, the percentage rates of success for anybody who does it. Mm. So uh, LG Barn sells those little bottles of, yeah, of the things. They have different, all different types too. Tisby's and they've got like the 550 blend and all this other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be a hard lesson for me. Eat some crow, <laughs> learn some lessons from these things and... Yes, every tank will eventually get them, but so live rock, I definitely wouldn't add them. Dry rock, biome, easy path to cycling, probably worthwhile. Dump some copepods in there, see what happens. Yep. Uh, another hard lesson learned uh, in live rock is that all pests with various degrees of life, oh all my. the pests. So there's various degrees of live rock. Oh, so okay. like there's live rock, like real reef. Well, you know what? There is uh, definitely... There's algae on there. Yeah, there's uh, algae growing on there. I've seen it. You can, I mean, it's just visible when you unpack it in some cases, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, when I unpack the Indonesian rock, uh, there's definitely, like, algae on there. It mm. looks like brasses to me. I'm not sure. Uh, we'll know probably in a matter of a couple of weeks as it grows a little lot larger. And Definitely in the other type of live, in the other live the rock. The golf rock, no, various Gorilla degrees. crabs and all, uh, aptasias that are in there and whatnot. Yeah, ocean aptasias, they look different. Yeah, I mean, this is live, this is rock that has been pulled out and shipped to you in a bag of water, you know? Yeah. And so for me, when I got mine the first time, man, I had bristle worms that were as big around as my pinky and this long, man, living inside of the sponges. I had 8 million gorilla crabs to the point where I stopped trying to take them out. There was mantis shrimp everywhere. Mm. Uh, and to be honest, I wish I would have just left the mantis shrimp alone. They were tiny. And they say you can break glass or something. I don't know. They never bothered in glass. They were just cool. <laughs> uh, but there were, uh, uh, what are, not parasitic copepods, but the ones that attach to your fish. Uh, um, um, I'm, I'm spacing their name. But they're like, they look like little millipedes that yeah, attach gosh, to the, the fish. Uh, Somebody will know. Somebody will know. Uh, there were uh, all kinds of, there was, in the beginning, I've never seen this again in my whole life. The first day that we put it in there, we saw, I walked up and saw it at night with a flashlight and the centipede looking thing ran through <laughs> the tank and they're like, what the hell is that? That's why man? I want live rock so And I bad. never saw it again, right? Uh, well, like, wow, well, cool, but also the sheer volume of pests. So, you know, think about the different stages of pests. So if I had... Live rock that came out of the ocean in bags of water, everything's game. 
every mm-hmm. disease, every mm-hmm. centipede, every, I mean, I don't even know what the hell that thing was called. <laughs> isopods and whatnot. Iso- oh yeah, isopods, yeah. parasitic mm-hmm. isopods. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, like I had those on my fish, by the way. They would attach to them during the day and then they'd fall off at night. Mm. Uh, came from the rock, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, when, when you think about it that way, and then you think about, uh, okay, well, I got it from the fish store. Well, the fish store has whatever was in the fish store's water. Yep. Probably not as bad as uh, they're not going to get 8 million gorilla crabs and, and, and uh, you know. Uh, no, but various algaes, dinoflagellates, yeah. uh, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Okay, now rock that is basically dry in a box, whether it be Indonesian or real reef wrapped in newspaper. It's probably been sitting there for two months that mm. way. Well, gorilla crabs off the table, mantis shrimps off the table, isopods are probably off the table, ick and velvet are probably off the table, but algae will make that trap. Yeah. Right? Right. So you pick the less of the evils if you want to go down that path, right? Yeah. So like a lot of people are like, oh, more, 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 more live. Well, yeah, more, 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 more pests. <laughs> and then it's like that the pendulum that swings back and forth. Yeah. Decide what matters to you and pick the thing that matters. Right. Okay. The next one, hard lessons. And this one, like when I started, nobody ever talked about dinos. Wasn't yeah. even on the radar. Mm, I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember it either. It was all like GHA and your standard hair algaes and all this other Bryopsis stuff. Bryopsis was a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, dinos are like an ongoing thing for a lot of people. It is a lot of people's problem. Right. And, and it I wish it shows up at a thin air, it feels. By the way, we have a five minute guide of beating dinos. If anybody watched that, you would beat it. It'd be done. Uh, you know, like there's some things you need to do, but if you did them instead of, and it, this is kind of that piecemeal reefing, if I like search for all the things and here's all the answers, well, the, here's the two easy ones I really want to do. Well, don't be surprised when those don't work. Yeah. If you really think about it and approach it uh, holistically, you will solve it. Mm. And is it a little bit more work? No, it's easier because you can do it right away instead of have this prolonged problem all, over months and like, you know, punching yourself in the face every day. This uh, dino conversation is really where a lot of this biome conversation comes mm-hmm. from because these are, uh, you know, they're, they're competing organisms. And uh, if if your biome or whatever the balanced reef tank biome looks like uh, is out of balance and dinos is uh, has a higher population, guess what's going to win? Dinos is going to end up taking over the tank and more and more tanks are experiencing dinos, meaning that the problem isn't uh, uh, the problem. S- seems to be that we're uh, the biome. In everybody's tank is the issue, not uh, you know where where are the dinos coming from. It's not like a magic uh, affliction to the entire hobby. All of a sudden, is now dinos. It's basically all this stuff lives on a surface, right? Yeah. Some of it breaks up at night, but like uh, during the day, all this stuff lives on a surface, and they're all competing for habitat. You know, they're competing for a little square of the, the reef. And the things that actually have to go hunt down organics to eat uh, usually lose to the things that can replicate very quickly I- I from photosynthesis. And you watch, if you're like, hey, dude, it doesn't even exist in the tank in the morning. By the end of the day, it's total slime coat. Well, mm. you can see how fast these things replicate yeah. by the hour, you know, yeah. and in minutes in many cases. Uh, they can reproduce themselves. So... Uh, you know, I think that dinos are a part of the whole thing of having the sterile type tank. And that's part of the reason why people use things like uh, Microbacter 7 and whatever. And you're boosting the, you know, competitive organisms in the tank to beat that one back that is very opportunistic. Mm. The dinos are very, very opportunistic to having available habitat, having no competitors for it. And then this like influx of all of this energy from the light. Mm. So, uh, you know, hard lesson there is, you know, just beat those things by thinking about biome and probably in most cases, if you put preventative uh, with a UV sterilizer in the beginning, there's a really good chance you never even run it. You never <laughs> even know what everybody's problem is. And then watch the five minute guide episode to help you out. All right, so another hard lesson. Live rock is expensive and it absolutely is. It, I don't know how, I guess uh, live rock really wasn't too much of an option and, and not uh, a very super popular thing when I first started, but your time frame it was. You know what? People don't want to pay for different options, and I don't blame them, blame them because partially we haven't really like 
you know, educated the masses as to what you're actually getting, mm -hmm. you know, for your money. And so people talk to me all the time, like, hey, do you think I should set up a live rock farm, you know, with pre-cycled rock? And I'm like, yeah, dude, that would be a great service, you yeah. know, to the community. Yeah. If you had rock that was as cycled as all that stuff that's sitting in the back of WWC's uh, bins, mm -hmm. right? You know, one year plus live rock that has never seen a fish uh, that uh, like uh, definitely doesn't have any of those parasites. No lights, definitely yeah. had, has never seen a coral. So there's no acro eating flatworms. There's no little red bugs. Mm. There's no uh, bryopsis. There's no you know aptasia. There's none of that stuff. Uh, and has all the right biome. You know maybe even tested by PCR. Mm -hmm. And like, all right. Well, that man is super, super valuable. And I actually want that more than I want the live rock that comes out of the ocean. Then, uh, then you have to explain why the value is so worth like the price. Like that's the nature of it is setting up, like setting up a farm like that and then paying people to operate it is more expensive than most people think. You just think like, well, you're just gonna throw some rock in there, bit. Like, yeah, I got a horse some, trough and uh, throw some rock in there with some power heads and good to go. Yeah, well, if that's the standard of quality, then sure. Uh, <laughs> but like also there's people that actually work there every day and take mm -hmm. care of the stuff. And mm -hmm. so, so I don't know, it'll be interesting to see. I've, I've heard a lot of people discussing this one, but I, I'm if it's not five years, it's definitely 10 years from now. That will be the number one. Dry rock will probably be old news. Live rock out of the ocean, for sure, will be totally turned off, mm -hmm. old news. Man-made rock uh, may be a combination of this whole thing. Uh, but I think that cycled rock, and you'll have to be prepared for the fact that it won't be $3 a pound. Oh, yeah. It'll probably be 10 you know? <laughs> uh, But here's the problem is nobody, the reason nobody's doing it right now is because nobody believes that anybody will pay ten dollars a pound at scale for this as long as yeah. there's three dollar a pound dry rock that it will just take extra time and I, I know that like right now there's people out there saying yes to both those things nope i'd rather just cycle my own tank and spend uh, 300 bucks on 100 pounds of rock than three thousand yeah. yeah and then there's somebody else out there that is saying nope i would rather have my two months back and i just pay a thousand dollars for sure uh, mm. to have perfect biome uh right off the bat not have to worry about it yeah uh I, I i'm dying actually if you feel like you are on one of those cases you, either way you know share it in the comments because i will share this with the people that are considering doing it uh and maybe they will go do it for all of us <laughs> i don't know we'll see all right so what's next